All right. Hello, everyone. This is my first time wearing a headset, so we'll see how fidgety I get, which is probably a lot. Um, anyway, so this session's exploring new stories and games, or I'm tired of being a hero. Uh, you know, I don't have the same bicep uh, endowment that some characters do, and I like to explore a couple of other things. So we're going to talk about story structure and how those rules allow us to bend and break them and use those structural elements to have a great understanding with your audience and then be able to tell some kind of other angle and story entry point. So a little about me. My name is Lindsay Rostel. I am a writer and producer. I recently have also taken on the role of game director. That's new and horribly frightening for me, uh, but it's a lot of fun. So I co-wrote and produced the episodic King's Quest series that came out a couple of years ago. We did five and a half episodes exploring like a wide range of themes. Um, hopefully a few of you played it, uh, but it was a lot of fun to create. I'm also currently now working on the Red Lantern, which we revealed at GDC this year as part of the Nindy Showcase. It's a dog sledding survival exploration game, uh, kind of set in a procedural narrative world. Um, so that's an exciting project I'm working on with my small team of five out in Los Angeles. And I'm also a partner and advisor with Kowloon Knights, which is an indie game fund. So I also get to help evaluate and promote other games that we're signing and looking at from acro across the globe. So it's been you know, a true honor to go and see all these new uh, teams and games and hopefully help you guys bring them to light. So now to kind of dive into things, let's talk about stories. So first and foremost, we love good and evil. It's super easy to understand. You can be like, oh great, I don't have to have any moral repercussions for anyone that I'm killing because they were evil. Um, some of us might be familiar with someone else who's recently labeled characters as evil and goes and murders a lot of people. Uh, but we're not gonna talk about Game of Thrones today. Uh, <laughs> So, but the importance of good and evil is it allows us to have tropes and archetypes. That makes it super easy for people to know immediately the type of character they're talking to, the world they're in, the situation they're in, and it can set up both expectations that are known and as well as surprise them. Uh, and that's really important because that allows you to play with like what your player and antagonist and protagonist are going to feel and how you can relate to them. So uh, you want to be able to easily identify who is good and who is bad. That's sort of what the whole thing has been for the past eons. Uh, you have your black hats, you have your white hats. It's coded. It's an easy to understand language. So Link is wearing earth tones. He is clearly a hero of good. Ganondorf is very darkly coded, unfortunately. So for a lot of things we need to work to fix. Uh, you have Korra, similarly happy, always has sort of a smirk. Amon wearing dark clothing again. He's clearly evil. Also, weirdly enough, when picking a lot of images, bad guys are constantly doing something like that as a pose. I don't know if it's like their oppression pose or whatever it is, but there was a lot of it. Um, see? Uh, <laughs> and Harry Potter, and you have Voldemort going on. And sort of the classic, and the one we'll return to a lot, just is the easiest to understand archetype structure and hero's journey structure is Star Wars. He's literally blonde, he's white, he wears white, and he fights someone entirely in black. Um, and so that's what that's playing with. And oddly enough, as much as I think this coding is incredibly clear and has been sort of a rule set we've created forever, uh, I was actually watching the final Harry Potter in the theater and this girl sitting next to me turns to her friend, I guess she's never seen one before, and Voldemort's on screen, she's like, is that the bad guy? And I'm like, he has a snake face. Like, he hisses. He basically glides across the floor in this drapey cape. I'm like, I don't know where this question is coming from. Uh, but it was kind of fascinating. So maybe it doesn't work for everyone. Um, but generally speaking, this is like an established rule that we've seen. And so much so that it can actually start to feel a little tired. So we've now just been experiencing so many stories from the hero lens, right? We are destined to be the protagonist. We are going to get skills unlocked that were unknown to us, but we are truly special. Like, we didn't know that. We, we are, we are, we are. And so we have this kind of thing fulfilled and built on top of us all the time. And so we're just exploring that in different skins. Um, even if it's an emotional tale, it doesn't matter. The cycle, if it's a cycle that can't be broken, you then use these skills after you've heeded your call to your adventure 
to basically kill problems. So that's what we've seen sort of in games, is this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy across the board. So you get to be a hero, and the way heroes solve problems is through killing. So you get this big hammer of a skill tree of magical abilities, guns, you know, swords, whatever it may or may not be, and you hit your problems, you hit your enemies, you hit your quests, and you get through all of these different components using the big giant hammer that is your skill tree. Um, it's kind of fascinating. It's super fun gameplay. I mean, I enjoy, you know, counterattacks and parries and all that as much as everyone else. But from a narrative structure, it doesn't always mesh, right? Like we can all have that moment playing like an Uncharted and suddenly you've just murdered like a hundred dudes. And you're like, well, that kind of feels weird. I was just going after this artifact. Um, and so finding how that's going to go from there. So, you know, smash those problems. Uh, that's a life lesson. Um, but you don't have to actually use the hero's journey in these archetypes directly. So this is what we're going to explore and kind of talk about in this overall talk is using these archetypes, understanding the hero's journey, like where do, we, where do we start to find new entry points, where are the soft spots within these stories in worlds to develop IPs and things that are other interesting ways to engage with it. And so the hero's journey is incredibly prevalent. Um, it works great with skill trees. It's so easy to understand. You get a ton of really interesting characters and your mentors and your tricksters. Um, but like, maybe let's, let's explore not being the hero. So uh, similar to art, we have to know the anatomy of this to be able to break it down and bend it. So we're going to quickly kind of run through, you know, the monomyth hero's journey of Joseph Campbell. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. I assume a lot of you, but if not, like, Let's do a quick refresher course through all of this. Um, so the stages of the journey simplified. There's like a little diagram here, which is just like a simple cycle. We're going to go through these steps individually. Um, and there's lots of this on the internet. You can get the book, The Hero of a Thousand Faces, um, which is sort of the classic one from all of that um, and things which have been built on top of it. You'll actually notice as we go through this, like, stories such as obviously Star Wars, which we'll use as our core example, Harry Potter, the Bible, all use this in like really interesting ways, right? And that's sort of like what Joseph Campbell was after at the time, was finding the mythical structure that related to, you know, all cultures. Um, it's a little generic, um, but so you can kind of, if you want to bend it, you can apply it to like everything, like, you know, trying to work out and get in shape. You can effectively say like, this is my hero's journey. I got a call to like be more fit. Um, and go through there, but like let's we'll stick with it from the narrative structure from there. Um, so yeah, hopping into it. So it's actually structured in sort of three parts. There's the departure, the initiation, and the return. And in those three parts, you have 12 steps. So you start out in the ordinary world. The heroes living in their ordinary world, just kind of doing their thing in their day-to-day -day life. They might feel like there's something more out there, but they don't know what it is. So like Luke's hanging out at home, kicking rocks, uh, being sad about being a farm boy, but believing there's something so much more for him out there. Um, and then he gets these droids. Um, and so something changes the situation, either from external pressures or something deep within the hero. And you have to face the beginnings of your change. So this often happens with what's called like the Herald character, which can be an actual character as in like R2-D2 slash the hologram or like Harry Potter's letter. It's something saying like, hey, guess what? There's this other thing out there. So Luke gets two new droids bangs on him a little bit, finds out there is something out there. Um, and he's like, okay, well, I don't know what the hell this is necessarily. This is like scary. Um, so we get into the idea of the refusal of the call. So the hero fears the unknown and shies away from the adventure in the new world. It's too much. They're not quite ready. They're like, oh, it's cool. Like this is here for me, but I'm not ready for it. So he doesn't want to leave. He has chores. He owes, you know, his aunt and uncle, like he has to help take care of them and run all the things. Um, this gift, I understand, is a thing that unlocked Leia, but I couldn't find a better one for him like being like, oh no. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, what ends up happening then is you have to meet the mentor who helps prepare you to go out on this epic quest um, and to learn more about yourself. So the mentor or supernatural being uh, tells you about this new world. They train and equip you, often revealing that you have like an innate power that you didn't know that you had before. So obviously Luke meets old Ben. Uh, and he's gifted in the gift that he know he's more than uh, 
ordinary, and later he's also going to get a lightsaber. Um, so Ben's providing this mentor. He's giving him this link to the new world, the world that is the Force, and unlocking that for him. So when we get to that point, Luke now has this information that he never knew before. So he's aware that this new world exists, um, and he has to decide if he's going to commit into entering the extraordinary world. So for him, he comes home and finds out his family's been murdered by stormtroopers. The world has kind of come to him. They've clashed together. And so in that clash, he's basically forced to be like, you know what, I'm going to go take part in this. I'm going to get out there and enter this new world. So that ends his departure phase. He runs into the initiation. So the beginning of the initiation section is sort of game at its core, right? So when you're leaving that departure, that's your inciting incident. That's your end of act one. You're getting out there and you're starting this whole process. So you're hitting your trials and tribulations, your friends and foes, and effectively leveling up. Um, you're going to find new allies and you're going to get a first taste of the antagonist. Um, so Luke goes to Mos Eisley. I, I can't say that. Star Wars words. And meets Han and Chewie. Uh, he also begins lightsaber training. And so Luke is leveling up. He's adding to his party. He is building new skills and building up from there. So there's this like easy analog that we can get through why you follow this hero's journey. Um, these steps kind of build up very logically across the board. Um, and then you reach this concept, which is called the approach, which you start to prepare for your major challenge. Uh, you know sort of your big bad is out there. Um, and that you need to go conquer this to save something, whether it's the world or a tiny child or what you, whatever you feel is your quest item. That is what you're preparing to save. Uh, you're not turning back now as you're about to make yourself known to this antagonist. So the guys head out on their quest. They haven't quite made it to the key ordeal, but the stormtroopers end up attacking them and they have to like run away. Um, so here's them running away to restart. And so in the restart, they do a little bit more preparation and they're getting ready for the ordeal, which is basically that pursuit of the bigger boss battle. You're going into the belly of the beast or the belly of the whale, um, which is actually in the idea of like Pinocchio. Um, so you uh, will enter a figurative or literal cave uh, space within the world and you're going to confront death or the greatest fear. So for Luke, like Luke has lost his uncle, who is his father figure. He doesn't know his father and he's legitimately about to lose another father figure, right? So that's like seeing this huge, like, greatest fear brought to life for him. They go there and they try to free, Le free Leia and they end up trapped in the belly of the beast, which happens to be, in this case, the trash compactor. Old Ben dies, as does Luke's belief that that can't happen. Um, old Ben is... Uh, like is resurrected sort of through the force, right? And becomes one with Luke. So his rebirth is sort of a melding with Luke um, and becoming this new character. So Luke now has an extra set of abilities because Ben has become part of him. Uh, so you can see Ben saying, I shall become more powerful than you can even imagine, which is the idea that he's going to become more powerful using the force through Luke and vice versa. Uh, so... Now that's like sort of the end of act two, right? It's the bottom of that big cycle we saw before. So you hit this big point where you're in inflection, you've seen the thing, you haven't been able to fully, like you've half succeeded. So you end up with a bit of a reward, but you haven't saved the world, right? You have this item that's gonna help you get to this next stage. So the hero obtains the treasure by facing death. They might celebrate, but the danger's still looming. It has not been conquered. So they escape with Leia and she has the Death Star plans. And so having that moment, you're like, okay, cool, we're ready to go. And then we start getting ready to get to our last section of the thing. So we're on the return, which is the road back. So you're kind of trying to enter back into your ordinary world. So he can't quite go back to Tatooine, but he's back in this zone where things are a little bit safer, right? So I don't remember what planet they're on and I should have looked it up, but they're planning like how they're going to go attack the Death Star. Um, and so they're getting ready. Everybody's sort of in their training session. They're looking at the plans and like, this is it. We're going to like, we're going to seize our world back. We're going to get rid of, you know, the massive evil that's only wearing black. Um, and Emperor Palpatine's also super scary. Um, he's also another one very much coded as evil. Um, and so you're in the friendly territory and you planned how to take it down. 
And so on this return to getting the world back to a safe place, you end up in the resurrection moment, which is sort of the climax. The hero severely tested once more. He has to be reborn on a higher level. So Luke, as a normal human, is trying to, you know, make the important shot. But it's only when he gives himself entirely to the Force is he capable of doing that. So he effectively kills normal Luke, right? And his reborn is, like, ready to be Jedi Luke. Um, and in that mode, he's resurrected as this, like, huge core hero in someone who has information and abilities that can't be taken from him. So he returns with the magic elixir, which in this case is complete knowledge of the Force, and is now bringing that to start the, the world anew. Um, they also get medals, because that's, you know, you get rewarded for Force. Um, and so they've able to eliminate the Death Star, they have the knowledge of like what the Empire is doing, and they're also much stronger in what they're able to do there. So that's like a quick and dirty rundown of this. Um, it's kind of easy to kind of like imagine how that fits in with Harry Potter, which also follows it pretty closely to a T, as do the other couple of Star Wars movies and many, many other pieces of media. And you can see it in a lot of games. This one's just very, very straightforward to use. Um, so along the way, you also meet a lot of archetypes. Um, so there's obviously the hero leaves his world, develops new skills. They're going to master the rules of the new world. Um, and save the day. You have your mentor, the magical person who gives you, lets you know you have innate gifts, gives you an item that's going to let you, you know, break through and do the thing. You have your allies, the loyal ally that admires the hero. They help the audience know that the hero is worthy of the trials ahead. So Frodo makes us believe what he believes, right? So he's telling us, uh, or Sam, sorry, Sam believes in Frodo, and so we understand the concept that Frodo can do it because Sam puts all of his belief in that, and Sam becomes an analog for us. The Herald, um, which we talked about, which is the idea of R2-D2 sending that message that there's a need for change in the hero's life. And then the Trickster. Trickster is a lot of fun. Um, it, he's actually, he or she is used to add sort of humor and other elements into the story and things that you're not quite sure like what their role is going to be. They help to change the status quo. This guy tends to do a lot of that. Get him out of there. Um, and then there's a shapeshifter, which blurs the lines between ally and enemy. Uh, in the old definitions, this has sort of been changed uh, recently. It was like the temptress uh, or like the femme fatale kind of character where you weren't sure if she was going to help you or hurt you. Um, Catwoman lives up to this like very well, um, but she's like a specific example of someone you're like, oh, you know, she helps Batman a lot, but she's also still out for herself. Um, and then the guardian, who's another person who's there to test you, make sure you're ready, get you out on your journey. And the shadow, this is usually the villain of the story. It can be your internal struggle or, you know, personified. Like, once again, villains are wearing black. They're the shadow of the hero. In Link, you have your actual shadow. You fight, uh, so does Sonic. Um, so <laughs> it comes up a lot. Uh, and so using those kind of things, they tend to mirror the hero in a negative way. So you're sort of cut from the same cloth. It's a yin and yang. It's the two sides of the same coin. Um, so it's easy to understand how the hero could flip to be the villain. Um, so that's, that's like the core big high level stuff, right? If you've all got it, super ready to go, right? Ready for dissertations. Um, and so let's think about how to mess with this hero's journey. Because like I said, I'm tired of actually being the hero. I think the journey is really interesting. I think it leads to a strong story structure, but there's so much more we can start to explore within this same realm because we understand these rules so well. We understand the good, the evil, the archetypes. Like we've been learning this since we were tiny children in every story that we've like taken part in and watched. And so, Let's, you know, look around how we can, like, nudge things a little bit further. So AAA has actually been exploring this in a lot of ways, and I think it's harder for them to be able to explore. Um, we're going to get into, like, why it's really exciting to be an Indian narrative, um, which is sort of the last little section of this. Uh, but the in the context of AAA, AAA is, you know, defaulted to being heroes. Big, big heroes, big skill trees, add all the things, save the world, um, and go from there. But we've also, you know, the ordinary person becoming extraordinary, but what about a god trying to be just a dad, right? So like God of War did something really, really interesting because you are 
a hero, like a big hero. You're a god, which is arguably something even more so. And his hero's journey is literally trying to become a dad. And so it's trying to take all these things that he only knows how to do, which is big and murder, and then kind of feed that into his child so that doesn't go the same way. Um, I think it's a really cool exploration. For me, it it's a little rough when all my skill trees are still about murdering people better. Um, I would have loved like a dad skill tree where it's like tousle Atreus's hair, maybe like a tighter hug, um, some extra comforting. Uh, like I would have just been like, oh, that's cool. Cause then I'm building skills that also equate to my journey um, versus you're building skills that are literally breaking down the barriers that are blocking you from it, right? So it's how do we defeat these waves? How do we go from there? Um, a game that's a little older that I really adore um, is actually about a rookie trying to find a squad mates in an occupied land. Um, and so you're maybe not the capital H hero of the story, like there's a superhero that exists, but you still have to be a small version of a hero and you have to be a hero for your friends and for yourself to get through it. And that was Halo at ODST. Um, I don't know if you guys have played this. It is one of my favorite games. It's really moody. Like the soundtrack just starts with like falling rain and like sad jazz music. Um, but it's a story of isolation, right? You've landed on Earth uh, after like Master Chief's taken off, you know, Earth's kind of in shambles and you're here trying to figure out what happens on the ground. Um, and so your squad's all been broken up and you're trying to get back together while there's like covenant forces everywhere and dealing with all of that. But it's a story that's truly about isolation and figuring that out. And what's really cool is they set up this, you know, original IP that follows Hero's journey like through and through and what Master Chief is doing. But then you get to come play in this world in this little side section. And it's meaningful and interesting because you know these rules that exist on the side. You understand this IP structure and you're kind of like, oh, is he going to show up? Like, is Master Chief going to come and like rain down havoc on these guys? But it's no, it's, it's just you and you're just you by yourself and you're just trying to get by. Um, and so taking that and understanding like what they developed with their IP and sort of taking the risk and being able to go do that as a title, like clearly it didn't sell like as many as the, the larger ones, but it's a really interesting experiment where it's understanding like how they could take such a cool thing and then build this small, small story out of it. Uh, and I do really recommend it. I think it's a, an interesting story. It's also, if you like Firefly, it's like the whole cast and Battlestar people too. So it's very much of that era. <laughs> um, and so uh, that was really interesting. And additionally, like AAA is exploring a few other things like the Last of Us is also exploring some really cool themes and the same idea where your hero's journey is like compressed into something much smaller. Um, and I, I haven't finished playing The Witcher, but I like the idea once again where you're the side to the, the actual hero, hero, right? So you're in support of her if she's like really a full superhero and you're kind of there, you're building your skills, but you're not as strong as she is, right? And so that gives you an interesting juxtaposition to be able to like be in the world, but not always be complete savior complex, not always be in the full power fantasy of what's going on from there. So, but at the end of the day, like AAA, it's hard for them to tell those small stories. It's hard to build the dad skill tree um, because like, that's not what like a lot of market demands for these large scale titles, right? You need these big loops. You need the, you know, super high and like punchy, juicy combat that comes out of it, right? That gets a little addicting and you want that feedback that's happening from there. You want to build those skills. You want to feel yourself grow powerful and be like, I am a hero. I am a badass, right? And then you need these incredible cutscenes and set pieces that kind of lay out the rest of the story, right? And so you have the incidental story that's happening as you're walking along and then they're building out these incredible set pieces that are the things that are telling you the rest of the narrative, but don't fit into the skills that you're building from there. And then a massive audience. So these things that are required of AAAs actually make it harder for them to experiment, right? Because you have to fulfill these things. Like a lot of gamers demand, you know, guns and shooting or whatever it is, because that's what a game is to them. And so when you have to like want to tell this story, but still fulfill those needs, you end up, you know, kind of fitting two things together that don't go as well as you might like. Um, but they're doing an incredible job. They're super fun to play, but we don't have to do that. Like in the smaller scale, we get to play just, we get to be small in all the things, right? Like we get to understand our niche 
and build that out. We can be an extraordinary world without having to be the extraordinary hero. We can tell that story that's often just as interesting, if not more so, just by looking at what that world's going to be. Like knowing that you kind of can't be killed and you're always going to win and you're always going to save the day, like is that as interesting as like the smaller moments where you don't know what's at risk and what like can you succeed? Um, and so looking a little bit at this, like how else can we live in these worlds? So how else can we be a character that exists in a world created by a hero? So this has kind of been happening in a variety of other media. Um, one of them is in comics, clearly like comics is all about expanded universes. Um, one I really enjoy is the comics Runaway, Runaways. Um, it's about a group of kids that are in LA. They discover their parents are supervillains and they ultimately run away. Um, and their parents are trying to track them down and who knows what's going to happen to them. Uh, but these are these kids in LA and the Marvel universe mostly takes place in New York. But they find out that these kids are, in, are out in LA kind of causing havoc because they don't really know what to do with their powers. And they're all from like a variety of different, you know, types of not, they're like only one is a mutant and the other ones have powers in different ways. Um, but anyway, like Wolverine, Iron Man, Captain America show up and they're like, what are you guys doing? You're like causing a lot of problems. And, and then they end up in like small little arguments and battles, um, trying to figure out like what's going on and what their rule structure is because like they're in this world, but they're living really outside of it. Um, and so it's interesting because it's, once again, you understand these rules that are there, right? You, you're in a land of supervillains, even if these supervillains aren't anyone you know. Um, but it helps give you that idea that's like, oh, I know these rules that are here, right? And that's what the hero's journey also helps us with. It's created this long understood set of rules that we, we can just skin in any different way and then enter in all these spots. Uh, something else, um, there's this great Idiazard uh, sketch uh, where he talks about the Death Star Canteen. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen it. We're going to try to run it for you in a not like clean way because I couldn't embed it. So we're going to run the YouTube video. Do you guys mind queuing that up really quick? Maybe. We'll see. If not, I'll act it out. I, I really won't. <laughs> That's okay. They might be eating. That's fine. Um, so the idea is basically the Death Star must have a canteen on it, right? Like who's going to get food? How are you going to go do that from there? And so Darth Vader is going down to basically get some pasta. Yeah. Yep, no worries. Um. Finally, I just want to talk about the future. The future? Where will the future be? Science fiction writers, they write it down, they write it down in I books, and it becomes funny. films, and then it all comes to pass. Like, those doors in Star Trek, <laughs> we've Switch got them videos. now. <laughs> that's about it. Uh, but that's happened. I think it's for sure. And okay. they we'll had uh, the Empire Strikes right, Back, the fifth of the four. It jumped ahead on YouTube, so sorry, guys. Uh, I recommend going to YouTube and looking for Death Star Canteen because uh, Eddie Izzard's amazing, and it's this whole idea that basically there's a canteen in the Death Star, right? Like someone has to feed Vader, and he doesn't understand really like how people can't be afraid of him, and uh, he's trying to get this pasta and like what that situation entails. And so once again, it's this rule set, and it's like, well but you have to do this thing. Like, what's that like? So, you know, what's the Stardew Valley of the Death Star Canteen? Um, and like feeding a lot of really insane people. Uh, and also you can look at like sort of sociological stories that come out of this, right? Like a world that needs a hero is a society that's a little bit broken, right? If you need a hero, you have villains, you have something else that's causing all of this. Um, so Batman's a really interesting example. Um, Gotham City is an awful place to raise a family. Like, I, I don't get it. Like, I don't know who would ever live in Gotham City. Like, they would have, the rent would have to just be paying you to live there. Um, but all I can think about is the idea where it's like, hey, I'm at a gala, and the penguin shows up and is like unleashing all of this stuff, but I'm just a normal person. And what is the survival game of Gotham, right? Like, what's my long dark in Gotham where I'm just trying to like, make it through this situation when like Arkham Asylum has just been like let loose on all of Gotham City. Like I'm hoping Batman shows up. Am I trying to get skills? Am I trying to fight back or am I, you know, hiding? And so like, I think it's really fun to start to take these things and flip them on their heads, 
right? And look at like what these different roles of characters and worlds and societies all create. Because like what Gotham has created as a society is rampant with, you know, crime and it has this one hero that uh, probably could fix a lot of it with money. Um, but instead he like dons the mask and goes and does it the other way. Um, and so there's like, these systemic problems that actually create the villains themselves and they create the hero. And what would that make you? If you were put in this world, would you become a hero? Would you become a villain? Or would you just try to survive? Um, and that I find is like really fascinating when you look at the sociological elements of what that hero's journey has created for the world it's in. Additionally, you can also look at things where it's like, you know, The Witcher 3 was doing that a little bit, but as a support for someone who's maybe not as heroic as they make them out to be. Um, and so like clearly Hermione is carrying a lot of that stuff. Like they don't survive without Hermione. Um, and so, but what's it like to play as Hermione instead, right? When there's this hero next to you who's getting so much credit because he's chosen, um, but you're the one who's on the ground like solving all these problems, right? Where you have this other element of like, but you don't care about credit because you're here to just do the thing. You're here to be a good friend. You're here to support it and you're here doing the cause. And what does that narrative structure look like? What does she think of her relationships? What does she think of the hero story? What danger is she in, right? Because like she still has like horrible situations happen to her along the way, right? She has to make the choice to erase herself from her parents' memory. Like, that's a horrible moment, right? Like, when you're given, like, a choice of what do you do, like, you have to make that choice and, dis like, make you disappear from your parents' memory. Like, that's incredible. And so, like, that those kind of moments are really rich and able to be played with because of the structure around it. So one thing to note, because I'm using IP examples, because it's sort of the easiest way to do it right now, it doesn't have to be off an existing IP, right? Because what we've covered is that the hero's journey is like so prevalent that it's everything, right? It's so much of story. It's just different skins. It's different flavors of all of that. And we live off of these heroes and these archetypes in the structure across the board. So using all of that knowledge that you have, you can break them. You can look at the public domain. Obviously, like Lovecraft has been rich for like a lot of people. King Arthur's out there, uh, you know, vampires, werewolves, all of that kind of realm, and so much more. Greek myths, right? Um, that's what all of this like also stems from. And using those parts, you can kind of come across and find these different places. And I mean, arguably, God of War is that, right? Um, it took a new hero's journey out of stories of heroes and gods. Um, but also don't feel like, you know, you don't have to feel like you have to make your story about a hero. You don't have to solve all your problems with punching or swords or guns. Thinking back to that idea of playing with the myths that we already understand, like, what if your Cerebus is caretaker? Like, you just have to feed your little three-headed dog and help make sure, you know, <laughs> the river Styx is working smoothly. Um, like, I don't know, that could be kind of entertaining. But like that still, you still understand the structures. You have your villain in Hades, you have Zeus. And if they show up, what is that gonna kind of relate to? And you're like, oh, I'm just taking care of the dog here. Um, and so thinking about like those kind of elements where we know all of this information, what's this new perspective? What's this new angle? What gives us a personal story into that? That might be a unique take that you hadn't thought of before. Like we're kind of talking about, what if you have to keep an incompetent King Arthur alive? Right? <laughs> That's a tough job. Or it's a rhythm game and you're just clapping those coconuts. But like, if he's like completely incompetent and trying to get himself killed all the time and yours are like solving puzzles of just like, please stop walking off the cliff. Please don't do this. Um, and playing with that story of like, what's it like to be the squire for someone who's entirely incompetent? Um, there's a lot of like rich humor and jokes you can kind of build out of that. Um, but all of this kind of really comes down to the importance of using these rules, using these structures and these things we know to find your story in it and find your theme. So everything's exploring a theme, right? A theme in what its hero's journey is going to be, what you're trying to kind of get across, whether it's like something about a relationship, you know, or you know, racism, or those are like really high level, obviously. Um, like I'm exploring sort of problems with identity and the idea of like identity and success in the world with what we're doing with Red Lantern. Um, so like how you're applied, your identity is applied to your job. 
um, and what that kind of means to people and how you need to see ways to seize that back. So like that's the thematic structure we're doing from there. Um, obviously that's not in this same realm, but we use this a lot for brainstorming at Timberline and clearly we used it uh, at King's Quest when we were trying to find different ways into fairy tales um, to bring them to light and kind of offer different perspectives. Like our third chapter, uh, if you remember, there's in King's Quest, he climbs up a Rapunzel's tower, there's a princess, they get married. And we're like, well, that's kind of boring. Um, what if she climbs up the tower and there's two princesses? And then it becomes this dating sim. Uh, and so it was like, how do we play and turn these on their heads and kind of look at them in a new angle? Like, we played with the concept of the trolls under the bridge. And for us, bridges grew out of the back of trolls. And they had a union. And so they would get up and they were tired of being bridges. They were tying, tired of having people walk all over them. Um, but it was taking these tropes that are understood and in these worlds and then applying these slightly new angles to breathe a different bit of life into them. Um, so, you know what? The beauty of all this is we don't have to sell a million copies, right, when we're doing indie games. I hope you do. Like, I hope you sell, like, you know, five million copies because that's incredible. And then you just have the freedom to create whatever you want forever. But, like, having that freedom where you don't have to fit all the check boxes that allow you to sell that many units lets you explore smaller stories, more emotional takes, and a whole bunch of things because... We don't have to kill the problems and we don't have to make sure every moment is fun, right? So when we look at what other media has done, like it's great, like I give me my Marvel movies, give me, you know, um, my big tent poles, love Into the Spider-Verse, but also I like Requiem for a Dream. I like the book where the red fern grows. I like feeling sad, right? I like the emotional expansion that these things give us. Right? And so, like, find the mechanics that kind of work with your story. But if your goal is to tell a story of grief or a story of misunderstanding through, you know, gender identity or something, right? Like, use that. Like, that doesn't mean you have to make it a, like a goofy game and over mechanics parts of that to be like fun, fun. Let those mechanics serve the narrative that you're doing because you don't have to sell a million copies. You have to find that niche audience that connects with you on that. Um, and so like brothers, I love brothers. I don't know if I find it super fun to play, like the puzzles are interesting, but I love the story it's telling. Um, and Grave of the Fireflies, I've actually never watched, but everyone I know who's seen it basically starts crying when I mention the name, so I thought it was a good example. <laughs> um, one day, I have to be like really in the mood for that. Um, but like I was saying, you get to innovate on mechanics and story and have them work together. Like that's super cool. And a lot of indies are starting this, um, and I just wanted to help kickstart a discussion about how structure can be turned on its head, how we can find unexpected stories sort of under the rocks, right? Under the bridges. Um, and so my font didn't go through, but anyway. So, you know, we have these new stories that people are playing with, right? Um, these are all exploring sort of meaty narratives and playing with how you interact with that narrative is really, really exciting. Like I adore these games. I think they're super interesting to play and I want to continue to, to see things, right? So hopefully using this lens, it will help spark new ideas for you and help you think about story structure in a way maybe you hadn't before or analyze it in a critical way and know where these archetypes can be taken, where they're useful, where they're not useful, which ones like... If you're playing with a trickster, what kind of trickster do you want? If you have a shapeshifter, is it an ally? Or is it going to backstab you? Is it more fun to play as you know that character than it is to play on the person who you know is going to win, who you know is going to save the day? Um, so yeah, I have like a few minutes. So I guess if if people want to do questions, we can do some questions. Like I said, I'm on Twitter. I'm trash at social media, but like, feel free to ping me, and I'll answer like two weeks later. Um, so I have six minutes according to this big clock. I think, I don't know where the mics are, but if we have a couple of questions, we can do that or you guys can go eat food. Um, yeah, uh, there's a mic coming to you. Give it one second. Hi. Hey. So what do you use personally for inspiration and kind of trying new things and discovering, yeah, doing something you haven't done before? I consume a lot of other media that's not games. Um, and I try to get out in the world a lot. 
Uh, I spend a lot of time in nature, in galleries, reading books, checking like on Spotify when new releases come out. I'll honestly just click on a bunch of random albums and throw them into play just to see what like happens. Um, I think like exposing yourself to a wide variety of things and having a team that's similar. I think that's really important. Like we argue about media all the time in the office because we all have completely different tastes, but we align in a lot of um, thematic places. Um, but like I was joking, I asked some of the team like, oh, what are your like sad movies? And it was like, you know, American History X and Requiem and Train Spotting and this whole set. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I am one of the only girls because it's not like Magnolias or Beaches or like there's like these whole like set of other movies that like if I were to ask some of my other friends that would come through. Um, but I think looking, looking at art is like something that I think is really huge. Like at this point, uh, when you look at the Renaissance painters, they were all painting sort of from religious iconography, right? Because that was where the main stories were known from as well as the world they could specifically see. Um, we've reached a point where everything's sort of a memification and a remix, um, which is great and interesting, right? So like if we look at the idols that we have now and the paintings and things that we're looking at is how like, what is the lens you pull like a Mario through at this point, right? Like what is an evil Mario doing? Um, and so there's this other new language that we're using that's more structured into the idols and characters that we see every day. Um, and that's sort of, I just ask questions of things. I think the key is just be curious, like go to use libraries still. I use the library like a lot. Um, so I can just like read a whole bunch of books and check them out from there. So uh, yeah. Anyone else? I try not to use Twitter too much because it's a vacuum. Um, cool. There's three minutes. I can just like vamp, uh, but I won't. Uh, cool. Well, thank you guys for coming. I hope it was helpful and I didn't speak too quickly. I was really worried about that. Um, thanks.